Welcome back to the Schwab Network. Live here from Philadelphia at the Schwab Impact Conference. We are in day two talking about strategies to navigate an environment of higher for longer and as we're learning here this morning, much stronger in the economy than expected coming off a 4.9% GDP print. We're gonna talk a little bit about the economy and some of the answers that advisors have to offer for this environment. Going into 2024 with David Giroux joining us, Portfolio Manager and Head of Investment Strategy, CIO at T. Rowe Price investment management. David, great to meet you. Very nice to meet you. I look, uh, look forward to the conversation today. Appreciate that. Uh, you want to talk a little bit kind of firstly about where we're at in the economy because uh, of course our expectations were so much worse six months a year ago. There was yeah. so much conviction. We'd be falling off a cliff basically and instead we're like going up, accelerating. Well, I think what's interesting, I, I you know, set the record straight. Last year at this time I was buying cyclicals. I didn't think we were going to have a recession. Okay. I, was, uh, I was in the uh, I was in the other camp on the on that side of the argument. Uh, I, what I would just say is recessions tend to be rare. You know, we, we tend to not be in recessions. You know, since World War II, like 10% of the time, and uh, even since World, in 1982, we're only in recession 8% of the time. Recessions are rare events, but Wall Street loves to call it recessions all the time. Yeah. So I, I'd say that one. I would say, even regardless of what we saw in the GDP forecast today, at the micro level, the company conference calls, companies we're talking to, the economy is slowing. Mm -hmm. Consumer is slowing, uh, China's slowing, uh, industrials are slowing, semiconductors are slowing. So I, I, the GDP may be a little bit of a rear view approach to how things are going. I think things are slowing though. We economy. got PMIs back above 50 even in manufacturing the last week. Yeah, but, it, but you're not really seeing that. You know, again, when we think about, on a global perspective, China is, is weakening, right? So China was disappointing in Q2, it's worse in Q3, it's going to be worse in Q4. Uh, Europe's kind of hanging in there a little bit, uh, but if you think about a more of a global perspective, I think, you know, which really drives this P500 earnings, I think we're, we're, we are definitely slowing. Do you see this as still the best house on the block compared to especially those two big superpowers of Arizona and China? Ab absolutely. Uh, best companies, best cap allocation, you know, really uh, still the most attractive market in the, in the, in the, in the, in, in the globe. The big worry in the corner of like the hyper bears is that this economic resilience is coming from deficit spending and stimulus still coursing through our veins. That's going to create the bond market as now a risk as the treasury keeps issuing more debt to pay for yeah. all that. Do you worry about that at all? Well, you, you do have to worry about uh, structural deficits being 7% of GDP. There was a long time ago we were really worried when it's 4 to 5% of GDP. Now we're at 7. Uh, and that's, honestly, that, you know, inflation's coming down pretty dramatically. We're going to get back into that 2 to 3% range next year. The challenge is, uh, maybe the opportunity is, now you're getting real yields of 2.5% above inflation on 10-year. That's really attractive for the last 10 years. That was 50 bips or 100 bips, right? Now you're getting 2.5% real yields. So that makes fixed income, all else equal, a little more attractive if I can get, you know, 7% kind of yields on a high quality double B or 9% on a high quality leveraged loan with much lower risk in the market. That's really, really attractive. So part of the reason why we've taken our fixed income exposure up from 20% of the portfolio a couple of years ago to 33% today. Mm. And is that on the credit side, corporate side at fixed income, or are you happy to just take on uh, treasury duration risk? No, I, I, I think you want to take duration risk today. Now that you're getting paid for duration risk, you know, a couple of years ago when, when the 10 year was at 2%, you were, getting, you were getting paid for duration risk. You had no real yield. Now you're getting a 2.5% yield. You know, treasuries do have a role in a portfolio if something really bad happens in the world, right? And there's a lot of bad things that can happen in the world, right? We think about China, Taiwan, what's going on in, in, uh, with Russia, what's going on in the Middle East. There are bad events that could happen in the world. Inflation's going in the right direction. I think it makes sense to start buying your treasuries, which we started buying last year, and we continued to increase our exposure to treasuries this year as well. So even as the yields have continued to push higher here, you're happy with the purchase in bonds because you just clipped the coupon, basically. Clipped the coupon, but you also have an insurance policy. Okay. You know, something bad happened in the world, and we said, you know, what ha what happens if the 10-year goes from 5% to 3%? That's that, that's a 20% total return. An environment where the rest of the world's uh, rest of the equities or other fixed incomes going down. 
So that there's a nice insurance policy that tends to play out in fixed income as well. You still feel confident that bonds will work in those type of risk off events? Because last year, of course, that was the problem. Stocks, bonds selling off together. Absolutely. Now the last three months again, people are going, okay, this is kind of happening again. Like we were in the middle of an earnings driven sell off yesterday. The bonds just started selling off again. Some people said it was the auction, but it was another example where there was already a risk off. Yeah, that's and right. And bonds sold off in the middle of a risk off event. Well, yeah, I think that that is absolutely fair. I would just say the idea that you're earning two and a half percent of real yields on bonds today, inflation's going the right way. If you think about all the reasons why inflation got to an ex extreme level, all those things are either correct or completely correct. You mentioned stim stimulus is out of the economy for the most part today. The Fed has rates at a, at a, at a very, very high level, which again, should push, uh, should push inflation uh, down over time. Uh, supply chain's been fixed for the most part outside yep. of aerospace and defense. So if inflation's going the right way, uh, real yields are attractive, we are seeing you know, flows into, into uh, treasury funds for like 35 straight weeks. So I think supply and demand is getting a little more balanced. You're seeing uh, pensions kind of de-risk as well. So again, who knows? All I, I can tell you is you look at a 5% 10 year treasury, that's pretty darn attractive. And there's an insurance policy attached to that. And not in every event, as you correctly highlight, but in a lot of events. Okay. Speaking of the changes that come about in the market, especially here with advisors uh, being the focus of this conference, of course, is from the equity side, the demand now is higher to have either performance or a yield or something with it yeah. to match and kind of create an alternative to now the bond alternative, which you point out is very compelling. You guys launched the TCAF, a pure equity yeah. fund, earlier this summer. How do you compete with high yields in an equity fund today? How do you accomplish that? Well, again, we're, we're not really trying to compete with necessarily with high yields. What, what we have basically, over my 17 year career in our equity sleeve, we've outperformed by 425 dips a year with a 0.97 beta. So that's best in industry equity performance. So a lot of people over the years have asked us, Dave, can we actually disinvest in the equity sleeve of CAF, right? Okay. Um, so what we've done was basically created a portfolio and an, and an ETF structure that should outform the market by 100 bips a year, have lower risk and be more tax efficient, okay. lower dividend yields. So if you, you think about that, that is a product that should disrupt the disruptors, if you will. Why would anybody own an SP 500 index fund if you have a strategy that can outperform, be lower risk, more tax efficient? Okay. And again, we've outperformed the equity market for 15 out of the last 16 years. And that's in the? Uh, in the CAF port equity okay. sleeve. Which is a cross asset, or that, that owns, just within the equity part? Just within the equity sleeve of CAF. Oh, okay. We've outperformed by 425 bips. A dollar invested in our equity sleeve when I took over, it's worth $8.19 today versus the S&P 500 is up $3.76. So we've more than doubled the returns the S&P 500 during my tenure. So if we can develop a strategy that, that allows investors to participate in that, in an ETF structure with really low fees, lower risk uh, than the market, lower beta, and more tax efficiency, we think that's going to be a very big product and actually you know, meet a, a customer demand there that we're excited about. It's long equity only, right? It's so this pure is just equity. pure it's stock pure picking active uh, management. There's no options overlay. No options. There's no all yield harvesting or anything like Absolutely that. Absolutely not. This is going right after that, that very large S&P 500 index business with just a better product, higher return, less risk, more tax efficient. The dream, what's been the secret sauce so far? Have you been able to look back and see, okay, there's a specific recipe here that I can just kind of set and go, or is this just bottoms up stock picking, you're in the right places? I would tell you, if you think, if you take a step back, if you look at the SP 500, there's, if you, there's six reasons why stocks tend to underperform over time, right? Six reasons. Either you got bad management, you got bad capitalization, you have secular risk, you have valuations are at, at an extreme, uh, you have companies that can't grow earnings and dividends at a high single digit category over, over a cycle, or they're just very, very high risk stocks. So if you actually say, what portion of the S&P 500 has one of those six fundamental challenges, sometimes have more than that, mm. you actually get rid of 375 companies in the market. So essentially what we do is we take out those 375 companies that have one of those, let's call it fatal flaws, we then we take that 125 list down to 100 names, because you know, there might be the seventh best utility, we don't sure. need to own that. We, the eighth best life science tool, we don't need to own that. Get to 100 names, make it, design it in a way that it should outform every year, and then you just you basically have a, a, a far superior strategy. And again, like I said, we have a track record of alpha. 
I know most managers outperform the market every year. Yep. We've outperformed 15 in the last 16 years, 425 bips with a beta of 0.97. No one in the industry has been able to put up that kind of performance. And so we think we're this, this, this TCAF ETF structure with very, very low fees is going to be very, very disruptive. And again, we hope to put out, the, we, we hope to uh, take the SP500 business, SP500 index business and make it obsolete. Okay, well there's a lot of AUM there to chip away at. Uh, we're, we're, over going, we're going for all of it. All right, love the confidence of the strategy and the, uh, the performance to back it up with the launch. And we'll definitely keep in touch, Dave, and I love the macro thoughts as well, appreciate it. All right, thank you. Absolutely, David Drew joining us from T-Road Price Investment Management.